Saints for Home and School 3. St. Francis Xavier Cabrini, 1850-1917. The Saint Among the Skyscrapers, Feast December 22nd. It may seem a long distance to most of us, from Sante Angelo near Lodi in Italy to Chicago in the United States, but to Mother Cabrini it was short. You see, the world was too small for her. Indeed, we have a marvel at the large number of orphanages, hospitals, and schools she founded. How such a little nun, for she was small, could travel so far and do so much, indeed very remarkable. Most of her work was done in the United States. She was naturalized at Seattle in 1909, and is therefore the first American citizen to be declared a saint. She died in 1917 at Chicago. Her body now rests in the chapel of Mother Cabrini High School in New York City. When Francesca Cabrini was a little girl, she had a favorite game of pretend. She made paper boats, filled them with violets, and sent them sailing in the swift currents of a nearby river. She pretended that the violets were missionaries, and she was sending them off in boats over the ocean to convert the people of far distant lands. Her uncle, Father Oldini, was the only one who knew the secret of her pretend game. He smiled, but warned her not to fall into the water. One day she did fall in, and she was being swept away by the current when someone pulled her out just in time. She did not know who it was, and didn't find out. It must have been her guardian angel, my little missionary, said Father Oldini as he told her not to play the pretend game any more. On the day she was born, a flock of white doves flew down to the farm where her father was thrashing grain. Several times in her later life, flocks of white birds appeared. Francesca loved them and compared them to angels or souls she would help save, or to new sisters coming to join her community. As a child, she learned to pray well. She was helped by the good example she saw at home. Her mother rose early to pray for an hour before going to Mass, and at the end of the day she prayed for an hour. Francesca would frequently steal away from the others at school to pray by herself in some quiet spot. She thought much about going to China as a missionary. She was never able to do so, but she always kept thoughts of it in her mind. Her sisters, however, were later to go, and are now at work in that country. In the little school which she first attended, her own sister Rosa was her first teacher. Francesca's favorite subject was geography. She loved to study maps and learn about the different countries of the world, because she wished to prepare herself to be a real missionary. She went to high school for five years, and then attended normal school at Lodi. At 18, she had her teacher certificate. Then she made application to join the Daughters of the Sacred Heart, who had been her teachers during her high school course. Mother Superior refused to accept her, because she didn't think Francesca's health was good enough. Of course, this was a great disappointment to Francesca. However, she remained at home to help her father and mother. Within a short time, however, both of her parents died and also one of her sisters. Out of thirteen children in the family, only Francesca rose, and one brother now remained. These three worked on the farm together. Francesca spent much time nursing an old woman dying of cancer. In 1871, she herself had smallpox, but was nursed so well by Rose that no scars resulted. By the time she was twenty-one, Francesca, we see, had suffered much, many deaths in her family, her own hard work as a nurse, and her own illness had all combined to teach her that everyone in this world has a cross to carry. At Cadogno, there was a girl's school in need of a teacher because the regular teacher was ill. Monsignor Soretti asked Francesca to teach there for two weeks. Francesca consented, but the two weeks stretched out until they became six years. 
Her experience with the orphans in that school was a good preparation for the work she would do later. At last, a bishop suggested to her that she should found a missionary order of her own. She gladly consented. Monsignor Soretti gave her money to buy a house. On November 14, 1880, the Monsignor said Mass for the sisters in their new home. This date is regarded as the birthday of Mother Cabrini's new order. Her community is now known as the Missionary Sisters of the Sacred Heart. This first house of Mother Cabrini's was an orphanage. Taking care of neglected children became the chief work of the missionary sisters, although hospitals and schools were also founded when needed required. Mother Cabrini often said to the bishop, My sisters must work in more than one city. The whole world is not wide enough for me. The bishop would smile at the, enthusi at the enthusiasm of this little mother superior. He never dreamt of the tremendous growth Mother Cabrini's order would show before many years had passed. Francesca and her sisters placed their complete trust in God. One day they had no money to buy food. She said to one of the nuns, Haven't you any money? No, Mother, not a penny. Look in your pocket, said Francesca. The nun turned her pocket inside out. It contained only her, her beads and some other articles, but no money. Look in your pocket again, Francesca asked. This second time seemed useless to the sister, but she obeyed. To her great astonishment, she found two large bills exactly enough to pay the merchant what he wanted for food. At another time, there was no milk left for the orphans. Francesca asked one of the sisters to go and look carefully in the kitchen, and there where only an empty container had stood before, she found it now full to the brim with milk. On one occasion, when the bread was all gone, Francesca sent another nun to look in the bread box again, and it was now full of bread. Soon another house of the missionary sisters was founded at Grimello, near Cremona. Now we are on the march, she told her sisters. This was followed two years later by a foundation at Milan. Many young girls had come to join the community. They could now spread out and do more work. Francesca wished to establish a house in Rome to be at the center of Christendom. It was hard to get permission to do this, but at last a cardinal surprised her by asking her to establish not one house but two. To get furniture for these houses, she spent many hours going to auction sales. About this time, many thousands of Italians had gone to the United States. They were strangers in that country. They could not speak English. They were suffering many hardships. They could not make themselves understood. In 1888, Francesca went to Rome to see the Holy Father, Leo XIII. Holy Father, she said, shall I go to China or the United States? Go to the United States, my child, replied Leo the Thirteenth. There is much work awaiting you there. So to the United States she went. The year was 1889. Six of her missionary sisters crossed the ocean with her. They were to work among the Italian people of New York. Soon an orphanage was opened in the city. The sisters spoke to the Italians in their own language. How glad they were to hear it in a strange land. Large numbers came to Mass on Sundays. The great work had begun. One day Archbishop Corrigan showed her a beautiful spot on the bank of the Hudson River. That is where you should have a house, Mother Cabrini. Your orphanage should be out in the country with plenty of fresh air and sunshine. Francesca remembered the archbishop's words. Two years later, she went to the spot again. When she had examined the house and grounds at closer range, she exclaimed, Why, this is the place I have seen in my dreams. She bought it at once. However, there was very little water on the estate, just enough for drinking, no more. Water for washing had to be carried in from the Hudson River. But that did not stop Mother Cabrini. She prayed that a good well might be found. One day, she said to some workmen, 
Dig here, and you will find water. An excellent well was obtained. There was plenty of water to supply all the houses. Francesca placed a statue of the Blessed Virgin beside the well, Our Lady's miraculous spring. The people called the place. Mother Caprini founded orphanages, schools, and hospitals in many cities of the United States. She bought hotels and turned them into hospitals. At New Orleans, she opened a mission to which many Italians came to help. In New York, she founded her first Columbus Hospital. It was clever of her to name it after Christopher Columbus, because the Italian people all knew about the great Italian who had discovered America, and they would know that here was a place especially for them. It grew to be a famous hospital, and yet Mother Cabrini had only $250 with which to start it. Francesca opened a house in Nicaragua. Then she crossed the Andes Mountains to Buenos Aires in Argentina and founded a house there. Later, she founded a house in Brazil. She established one in Paris, France, and another in Spain. She visited England and was delighted with the kindness and courtesy of the English people. She wished to establish a house everywhere. The world is too small, she said. In 1900, she visited Pope Leo XIII again. He was then ninety years of age. One day, he said to her, Let us work, Cabrini, let us work, and what a heaven will be ours. Then, after he had passed, he turned around and looked at her again. Let us work, Cabrini, he said, his kind old face all wreathed in a smile. One day, Francesca and one of her sisters were walking along the road, on their return from examining a country estate, a lady stopped her car and gave them a ride. We were just looking at a beautiful estate that would be just the place for us to shelter our orphanage, said Mother Cabrini. Where is it? the lady inquired. Mother Cabrini pointed to it. The lady was astonished, and with good reason. Why, I am the owner of that estate, she exclaimed. Some time later, the lady sold the estate to Mother Cabrini for a small sum. New York, Chicago, Denver, New Orleans, New Jersey, Los Angeles. These are cities of the United States in which Mother Cabrini opened her houses. The fact that they were so widely scattered over the country gives us a glimpse of the vast work this little nun accomplished. Mother Cabrini never enjoyed perfect health. Most of her work was to be done in spite of this heart, of this handicap. An ocean voyage during which she had to rest always made her feel better. She crossed the Atlantic about twenty times in the going and coming she found necessary as the head of a vast missionary enterprise. From each voyage she seemed to receive more strength to continue her labors. World War I was hard on her. She was distressed so much by the sufferings in the entire country. In 1917, particularly, she did not feel well. Her health failed before the end of the year. She was in Chicago then. On December 21, 1917, fearing that the children in one of her schools might miss their usual treat of candy for Christmas, she began to make up the little parcels with her own hands. Let us hurry, she said to her sisters. The time is short, and I want to be sure that the children will have their treat. No wonder she wanted to hurry. She must have felt death upon her, for the very next day, December 22nd, she died. The children would have their Christmas treats on earth. She herself would enjoy hers in heaven. On July 7th, 1946, the Holy Father, Pius XII, canonized her at Rome. While the ceremonies were going on, American planes flew in beautiful blue skies over St. Peter's and dipped their wings in salute to the new saint, the first American citizen to be raised to the honors of the altar. St. John Chrysostom, 345-407 to The Gold-Mouthed Orator Feast is January 27th. The pupils of Sister Anita's class were studying the chief cities of Europe. 
Please go to the library, she said one day, and look up the pictures showing scenes in Constantinople. Located the city on your map and find out what you can about the strait leading to the Black Sea. When you have done that, you will be better able to follow the story I have for you tomorrow morning. The next day, the pupils were ready with the answer. They were good workers, and besides, they liked stories, especially those told by Sister Anita. We'll have time for one report, she said. Jack Hickley, let us hear yours. The name of the strait, replied Jack, is the Bosphorus. It is about eighteen miles long and from a half mile to a mile and a half wide. It connects two seas, Marmora and the Black. It is used by the ships of all nations. A very clear answer, Jack, said Sister Anita. Then she continued, Let us imagine ourselves in Constantinople on a certain January night of the year 438. Crowds of people are making their way through the narrow streets. Where are they going? We follow them and soon arrive at the water's edge. What a sight there greets our eyes, thousands and thousands of torches on the shore and thousands of torches on the hundreds of boats in the channel light up the Bosphorus with their reddish flickering flames. For miles and miles the strait seems filled with fire. What is the reason? It is because a ship draped in black is sailing into the harbor with the coffin of St. John Chrysostom on board. It is thirty years since he died and was buried in a far country, but now, by order of Emperor Theodius II, his remains are being brought with great ceremony to Constantinople, where they must be buried with highest honors. Who was this man that so much respect should be given to him? He was born in the city of Antioch about year 345. The people there were proud that their schools were among the best in the world, for they were much interested in education. John's mother, a pious widow named Antheus, sent him to the best professors she could find. Under their care he became so brilliant a scholar that the headmaster wished John to succeed him as chief teacher in the school. The young man became a lawyer and for some time practiced at the bar. He attended sports and games of all kinds, but one day he met a holy bishop named Miletius. After that he was so taken with spiritual things that he left the law to study for the priesthood he was then baptized. It may seem strange to you that he was not baptized before that, but in the early days of the church many people were full grown before receiving baptism. John had a very dear friend there named Basil, now known as St. Basil the Great, who persuaded him to go to the desert and live the life of a hermit. The hard life and the penance he performed there almost ruined his health. Yet he forced himself to remain in the desert for seven years. He then returned to Antioch, took care of the poor for five years, and finally was ordained to the priesthood. At first he was not a good speaker. He kept practicing, however, for he knew that practicing is one of the chief duties of a priest. He gradually improved and soon became a great orator. He pleased more people who listened to his sermons, then they gave him the name Chrysostom, which means golden mouth. In fact, some scholars say he was the greatest orator who ever lived. His learning and wisdom, combined with his great power as a speaker, soon marked him out among men. He was compelled, much against his wishes, to become Bishop of Constantinople in 398. In his palace he lived a life of poverty, he spoke much against the luxuries and sin of the city. This made many enemies for him, especially among the rich and powerful. His chief enemy was the Empress Eudoxia, who made up her mind to get rid of him. At length she persuaded the Emperor to banish him, but the people found out about it and forced the Emperor to bring him back again. He continued to preach against the scandals at court. For revenge, the Empress Eudoxia had him banished secretly from the country. He was taken by soldiers to Cocos, a small village in Asia Minor. 
His enemies hoped the severe climate of the place would cause his death, but he continued to work even in exile and wrote many letters to the people of Constantinople urging them to return firm in faith. Many persons began to complain about the injuries to the holy bishop the empress then persuaded the emperor to send him to another place so the people would not hear so much about him. The soldiers were ordered to take him to a small village on the northeast shore of the Black Sea and to make him suffer as much as possible on the journey. The soldiers did as they were told. Although each day the sun burned him severely, they would not let him rest. At last they reached a small village named Komana. There a saint appeared to the bishop and said, "'Tonight you shall be with me in glory.' The soldiers, seeing that their prisoner was dying, took him to a priest's house in the village. There he clothed himself in white garments, the symbol of holy life, received the last sacraments, and then after saying, "'Glory be to God for all things,' which he had said so often since his early years, he passed in his eternal reward, the date was September 14th, 407. Thirty years later, when his body was brought back to Constantinople, Theodius II, son of the emperor and empress who had banished the saint, laid his head on the coffin and in tears begged forgiveness for the injuries that had been done. St. John Chrysostom is remembered not only as the gold, golden mouth orator, but also as a great writer. His most famous book is entitled On the Priesthood. All his writings are so full of wisdom and sound teachings that he is called one of the four great doctors of the Eastern Church. Would you like to hear a few sentences from his writings? asked Sister Anita. Yes, sister, exclaimed the pupils, all of whom had listened with great interest to the story. Sister Anita then read the following words of the great bishop. A father who loves his son ought more to rejoice at seeing him a priest than if he had seen him a thousand times king of the whole world. Water does not so easily wash away the spots of our clothes as alms blot out the stains of our souls. The sighs and groans of the poor pierce the heavens and bring down the vengeance of God upon the rich upon cities and upon whole nations. A mother who does not complain at the sickness and death of her dearest child, but thanks God with perfect submission to his will, will receive a reward equal to that of a martyr. The best revenge we can take on our enemies is to forgive him. The very company of detractors is to be shunned. They are like flies that feed on filth. So great is the power of charity that it makes a soul wider than the heavens. St. Francis de Sales, 1567-1622 The Rider with the Golden Pin, Feast, January 29th All that is not eternal is not worth a thought. This was the motto of St. Francis de Sales, Bishop of Geneva and Doctor of the Church. He was born on August 25, 1567, at the castle of Sales in the province of Savoy, that district of France which lies in the Alps mountains just south of the Swiss border. From 1602 until his death in 1622 at Lyons, France, he was the beloved Bishop of Geneva, the city where the League of Nations once held its meetings. Thus a life of fifty-six years was his, not a ripe old age, to be sure, yet the great works he did in that time make him remembered, even after the passing of more than three centuries. Why do people love him? What do they find in his life to attract them? Let us start with his years and find the answer in his early life. It is the summer of 1572, the beautiful garden surrounding a castle near Annecy in Savoy are in full bloom. The Countess of Sales and her little son, five years old, are seated on a bench under a spreading oak tree. Songs of a bird are borne on the peaceful air, and a little brook babbles merrily at the edge of the garden. 
Yes, Francis, the mother is saying. God made all those pretty flowers, the red ones, the white ones, all of them. He made you, too, all the little boys in the world. And did he make all the people I know, Mama? Yes, my boy. He loved them all, too. He also wants us to love them, especially if they are poor. This morning I saw some little boys and girls who haven't enough to eat, nor clothes to wear. Why haven't they, Mama? asked Francis, his innocent eyes wide open in wonder. Their daddy is poor, the mother replied. You and I will take them some food and clothes this afternoon. God will bless us for what we are going to do, my son. So it was that Francis de Sales learned from his pious mother, whose beautiful lessons of charity he practiced all his life. Other lessons he learned, too. How to hear Mass devoutly, to love our blessed mother, to follow God's will. Come and see my chapel, Mamma, said he one day to his as he walked in the garden. Here is where I tried to make one and he showed his mother a little altar of moss. See, I made a cross of flowers for it. The mother smiled. She knew her lessons were being fruitful. His good parents gave Francis an excellent education. They sent him to the College of N.C., where he made a rapid progress. Later he attended the famous University of Paris and studied many subjects with great success. Then another university, that of Padua, Italy, opened its doors to him, and there he took the highest degree, Doctor of Laws. When his years of study were over, he seemed to hear a voice saying to him, Leave all and follow me. He obeyed. He left all, the fortune his parents would have given him, the large castle of sales. This beautiful grounds all the honors that might have been his. Why? I wish, he said, to go into the highways and byways, seek out the poor and sinners, and watch by the bedsides of dying people, so that I may gain all for Christ. Then he and his cousin, Louis de Sales, who was also a priest, became missionaries in the town of Thonan by the Lake of Geneva, where many had fallen away from the church. The sermons of the missionaries were effective. At the close of one mission, the number of conversions was at least 20,000. Every time they preached, the crowds were very large. On one occasion, after a sermon on the Blessed Sacrament, at least 600 people knelt down and made their peace with God. Soon Francis was appointed Bishop of Geneva. On December 8, 1602, he was consecrated in the Church of Thonon. What a touching sight it was when his aged mother knelt for his blessing. Shortly afterwards, when his mother died, Francis said, I had the strength to give her the last blessing, to close her lips and eyes and give her the kiss of peace. Then I wept over this good mother more tears than I had ever shed since entering the church. As Bishop Francis followed a strict rule of life, he usually rose at four o'clock in the morning. Each day he devoted himself to prayer, study of the scriptures, visiting the poor, and the general business of the diocese. He also found time to write those wise and loving counsels, which have been a source of inspiration to thousands of people during the past three hundred years. Even King James I of England, although not a Catholic, read them with much interest. The writings of Francis de Sales, he said, inspires the greatest devotion. He wrote of charity, spoke of charity, practiced charity. One day, when an avalanche had destroyed several villages, he announced, I shall visit my suffering people. But my lord, said the messengers, who had brought him news of the disaster, you must not go. Huge rocks have fallen on the roads. Trees are uprooted. We had to climb over them to get here, and we had the greatest dif difficulty going. But they should be afraid, said the saint. Was I not brought up in the mountains the same as you? I shall go. The people are in danger. Their bishop will visit them. In his lifetime, this great saint converted more than 60,000 souls, all attracted to him by his kindness.
You can catch more flies with a spoonful of honey than with a hundred bears of vinegar, was his guidance. Among the thousands of souls inspired to lead better lives, through the influence of St. Francis de Sales, there stands out one in particular. She was Jane Francis de Chantel. To her he wrote many letters, all of which led her more and more towards perfection. She founded the Order of the Visitation Nuns under his direction. For these sisters he wrote two beautiful books. One contained the sermons he gave them, the others was entitled On the Love of God. After this book was published, he had many letters asking him to continue writing. In the convent of these nuns at Lyon, France, St. Francis prepared himself for death. My pains, he said, do not deserve the name of suffering when compared to those of my divine Lord. As the prayers for dying reached the words, All ye holy innocent, pray for him. His beautiful, kindly soul took its flight to heaven. This was on December 28, the Feast of the Holy Innocents, in the year 1622. Many miracles followed his death. Some years afterwards, when his coffin was opened, his body was found incorrupt, meaning that it was exactly the same as when he died. And the most delicious fragrance spread all through the convent. Thousands of people crowded about the shrine, where his remains were exposed in view. "'We shall die,' they exclaimed, "'if we do not look upon our holy bishop.' He was canonized in 1665, forty-three years after his death. Thus the kindly St. Francis de Sales, now called patron of the Catholic press, was raised to the highest honors by the Church.' 